So um, today we're talking about the um, Sanborn map. Sanborn maps are a really interesting thing here. Um, you know, we, we are wrapping up our theme this month of you know, March mapness, which is the idea that we're going to put a showcase on the maps and the, sh and, and the stories that they can tell us. Um, and the Sanborn map is, I think, a, maybe the best distillation of why maps are so interesting, at least to me. You know, maps are created for a very specific purpose. They want, you, you know, want to see what streets look like right now. You don't want to use a map that's outdated. You know, maybe things don't change that much over the long term, but, or the short term. But yeah, if you, you're not going to want to pull a map up of, of, of Wassa to get around town that's a century old. You want something now. And so that need to continue to, you know, have a updated version means that there's this, this continual, um, you know, record that's left. Um, we don't, they didn't intend when they created, you know, a series of, you know, railroad maps to show, the, you know, they just want to see what it is now. But because all of those things get created, you can compare them and to see the development of a city through a street map, um, you know, a rural area through a, a plat map, um, or, you know, Sanborn maps, which again, very specific purpose. They aren't intended when they're created for the purpose of telling us a historical story, but they actually do that pretty well, um, which is why they're pretty cool. So that specific purpose that Sanborn maps are created for, though, is for fire insurance purposes, which seems kind of strange. Um, so a little background on that fire insurance. Um, kind of emerges after the Great Fire of London in 1666. That's kind of what they tend to go back to. This is kind of the birth of the insurance industry. It's kind of getting started. And, and after this fire in which something like 12,000 homes are destroyed, they decide, you know, maybe, maybe property insurance might be a thing to do. And so over the next century or two, this, this concept of, of property insurance grows and develops. Even comes its way to the United States um, as a you know colonial uh, Benjamin Franklin, um, sort of early founder uh, and, and statesman and, and all of that, uh, was a guy who was a big proponent of property insurance. He actually had a property insurance company, um, and that company, um, you know, well, very similar to wherever you're going to be. Where if you're if you're looking to do a fire insurance policy. Right. If you're if you're looking to um, uh, have a, a prop, your property taken a, a policy on that um, in case it burns down or there's a flood or something um, like any type of insurance, you have to send somebody out to take a look at things and to say, OK, is this a wood frame building that's next to other wood frame buildings? And maybe there's a, you know, a sawmill right next door or a theater or blacksmith, something that's going to more likely to burn you know, maybe we don't, we don't want to put too many eggs in that basket. Maybe that's too risky. Actually, Ben Franklin's company back in Philadelphia uh, initially said, if you have a wood framed home, we're just not going to do a policy. It's just too risky. But if it's a brick or a, you know, a stone building that's in the middle of an empty block, yeah, that's going to be a lot less risky for them to take a policy in. And you might think, you know, because as, as time goes on, you know, it's pretty easy for someone in Philadelphia to get a, someone to come out and take a look at their home. It's harder for someone from out of state to get a policy until, you know, because, you know, it's, it's a bit of an ask to send somebody all the way, say, to Wisconsin from Philadelphia in order to get a policy. Uh, but the thing that changes is um, fire insurance maps. So the idea for this, uh, this is uh, one of the early maps um, by William Paris, who's a, a British surveyor. He gets tapped by um, a guy named George Meade. Um, and around 1850, they make the first map of, uh, of this type for Manhattan Island um, in, in New York. Now, these early maps, um, you know, obviously big cities are the ones that they're really, you know, people in New York. But the, the advantage here is that you know, if you're in New York, you don't actually have to, like, you can actually take a look at the map and see where all the buildings are. You can see what they're made out of. You can see sort of all the information you need to know without actually having to physically go. Maybe you still want to follow up. But when they did this, now suddenly you don't have to be in Manhattan or in this case, you know, New York in order to understand what things look like. And this gets um, sort of continuation of, of more and more, and it really gets perfected by Doug, uh, Daniel, um, Daniel Sanborn, um, D.A. Sanborn, uh, around 1865 or 66, 67, he starts getting into this and he creates his company in 1867 and they really corner the market. 
Now, granted, it's a very, it's a very specific market, right? It's a very niche thing. These are not maps that are going to be at the public library or the city hall or, you know, personal collection. These are going specifically to insurance companies that write fire insurance policies. So that's a very specific market. But the Sanborn map company does really, really well in part because they have a very consistent quality product, but also because that product, they, they do a lot. Um, this, this particular year, this is from the first Wassa edition in 1884. In 1884, they do 44 cities in Wisconsin. Now, previous to that, as far as I can find, at least, there were only eight that were done before 1884. And six of those eight was in 1883. So Sanborn Map Company really tries to get as many cities surveyed as possible at the same time. And so this leads to uh, the ability for someone, say, in Wassa, um, there's a bunch of, I mean, all over the place, uh, there's, there's a bunch of, actually in Colby. Uh, Colby's the other city in Marathon County. Um, I guess you could say Marshfield too, but at this point it's not quite over the county line. Uh, we, I don't know if that we consider that to be a Marathon County city, but um, certainly Colby and, uh, which is kind of also on the county line, but Wassa is, is the big one, right? So this is what, uh, you know, okay, let's, let's kind of go through the process. If you, if you were in Philadelphia or New York or something and you wanted to check, someone wants to have their house insured on, on Stewart Avenue in Wassa, um, you'd pull up the map um, uh, or, or let's say Scott Street, I guess maybe it'd be a better one. Okay, Scott Street's over here. Um, you can use the map here. Um, so this is the first page and then there would be subsequent pages. In this case, there are 11 pages for the city of Wassa in 1884. So to know what page you need to flip to, you would look at the map at the first page, or if you didn't know what the street layout, you could just use the index. It just has a listing of the streets or actually the major companies and, and buildings that you might need. So points of interest. Um, now they redo this every few years. Like I said, that's the strength of these maps. So about every seven years, they put out a new edition. So first one is in 1884, the next one is in 1891. And you can see that there are more pages. There's more areas that are covered. Um, so the colors kind of depend on what page you're going to. Uh, uh, two points of, 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 that I'll point out here too. There's also some white spaces. There are blocks here. Um, that are already laid out and there's, there's stuff there, but there's just not enough people there. There's not enough points of interest for them to decide, okay, we need to survey this. Um, the other point is they're not always on the same page. Like it, here in the center of Wassa, um, yeah, this 12 city block, nine city blocks, we'll just make that one sheet of paper. But sometimes you can see like, um, for example, I think there's some good ones here. Yeah, 1898, again, seven years ahead. You can see that there's 22 and 22 and 15 and 23 and 25. And so there's these little areas. Maybe there's a little company or a depot or, or whatever that you want to make sure that you survey, but you don't want to do the whole, you know, neighborhood. Um, and so sometimes they will do a composite and we'll, we'll see an example of that in a second here. Um, next, 1904. Um, so not quite seven years, but six, you know, um, 1912, um, so about eight years. Uh, th at this point, this, the, the map becomes so large and the index is so large that they actually put it on a second page. So there's a whole other page for the index. Um, and again, you can see the, the, the growth of Wassa. And, not, and this is just the areas that are big enough to survey. Oop. The wrong button there. All right. So um, this is 1923, um, sort of. Um, this is actually, this is 1923, but it's also 1931. What I mean by that, um, and I should say before I get into that, this is the only one that we have in our collection. We have uh, reproductions of some of the other ones, most of the other ones. But we actually have the physical book in our collection, um, which is why this is like a physical, this isn't a good scan. I had to take my, you know, a camera uh, to, to do this. But um, you, so you can see kind of the waviness of it. You can see also it's been papered over in some places. And this becomes obvious, you know, if I adjust the contrast here. You can see that there are um, some, some areas that have been papered over. And the reason for that is in the 20s, the Sanborn Map Company, instead of making a brand new edition every few years, realizes that they can put out more, you know, more additions, more, more adjustments. Um, if they just use the old one, um, like for example, here, you can see this blue bit at the bottom here, 59. Um, I don't know if you can read 59, but that was a whole new area. Um, and so instead of making a whole new issue uh, just to do that, they just said, well, we'll just plot that area and we'll add an extra page at the end. 
And if there are any changes, um, as there often are, we'll just add little um, sheets of paper that you can paste over, um, like patches, um, and that will make it up to date. And so that's what you see. So technically, this was originally 1923, um, but essentially, um, anything that you're looking at is, is correct up to 1931, um, which adds for some interesting things. And then the final one is put out in 1954. Um, in the 50s, they start to do some changes in the, in, in the industry. The fire insurance companies start to move away from maps and more towards other methods like cards. It's kind of complicated, but the, but the end result is that the Sanborn Map Company can't really put out maps because nobody, it's, again, they put all of their eggs in this one very niche basket. And so as a result, uh, when that basket isn't interested in the eggs, um, they have to do other things. Uh, the company, I think, is, is actually still around, although they do you know, other type of things. But these particular types of maps, basically, they don't exist after 1960. So this is the last one that's put out um, in this level of detail um, you know, for this, this purpose. Um, yeah. But again, using 1954 to 1880, back to 1884, we can see a very big difference in the, the maps and what they show. Um, so what is an actual page? You, you found what, what page you want to flip to. Um, let's go back to 1884. Um, here's Scott Street. Um, this is a kind of cropped version. Uh, one thing that's important to note is these are all the exact same standardized si sizes. So they're always 50 feet per inch, which means that the level of detail is always going to be at the same level. They don't shrink or ex expand the pages, what's shown on it, um, in order to fit more or less on a page. Um, it's just the same. Um, and that way you can, you can always kind of get a sense of the scale. Uh, you can always see because everything's at the same uh, um, level of detail. So this tells you, you know, okay, well, the streets are 66 feet wide. Um, you know, here's the, the blocks. Here's where things are located. It has labels. Sometimes it has very generalized labels like um, grocery store or blacksmith or something like that. And sometimes it does, as in here, say, Bellis Hotel, Kickbush Roller Mills, things like that. So obviously there's different colors too. Um, and I should say there's an index at the front of all of these books that tells you what all of these things are. Most of the stuff is the level of detail that we don't need to know here. But one of the important things is colors. So we can tell if it's yellow, if it's, it's, it's colored yellow, that means that is a wood framed building. If it's blue, that means it's a stone building. Or later on, it also includes concrete buildings. And that becomes more common. And then if it's red, it's a brick building. And if it's a uh, full red, that means it's a brick frame. And if it's um, got a different color inside, like, um, you know, there's some down here, um, that means that it's, it's like a wood or a stone frame building with a brick veneer. So this is actually very helpful for kind of identifying what you're looking for. So it's like an example of, of doing sort of, because one of the ways that you can use this is you can use these additions to see how an area develops. So let's look at this area of Grand Avenue. Um, so here we have uh, Frank Matthews Brewery on Grand Avenue, um, as well as George Reuter's Brewery. And the concert hall, which is what this would have been a beer garden down here, um, owned by Frank Schubert. Um, oh, here, go back here. Um, notably here, here's this example of like, okay, well they also, there's not as much on this other side of Grand Avenue at this point. So we're just gonna put the breweries, that's what's important in 1884. And we'll use the space to, to put some other little areas there too. It's also crooked just so that the perspective of Grand Avenue doesn't change as we go forward. Just, you know, aware of that. 1891. Okay, well, now we've got some houses. In particular, we've got the St. Mary's Church, which gets built at this period. It's a brick building here, right? Um, also, the first St. Mary's School, which we can tell here is a brick veneered wood framed building. Um, so we can kind of compare and contrast that and, and see that those developments. Um, you know, we're still gonna, you know, include some other areas here in this map. Um, it's not completely uh, need to know all the blocks, but um, it's developing. When I go to the next one, I want you to keep an eye on the bottom left corner here the, of the, the George Reuter Brewery, um, because in 1893, there's a fire. And so as they rebuild, the footprint changes because it's a new building. So this is a way that you can also see this too. Um, when wings get added, when things get renovated, when things just completely change because, you know, fires happen, um, that happens there too. Um, also notable here over on Seymour Street, you have the um, Longfellow School gets built. So this big brick building, um, it's another addition there. 1904, again, we're kind of moving forward. Um, 
1912, you know, more buildings, uh, notably the, the Columbia Hall, which had been built by Reuter um, after the, 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 it burned down to replace the beer garden. Um, there was another fire in 1906, and now it's a bottling facility. It gets gutted, um, and they decide they don't want a, a, a hall, they want a, a bottling facility because that's what they need. So it's no longer Columbia Theater anymore. Um, 1923 to 1931, so this, again, the, the addition. Um, and you can see, I hopefully you can see here, um, there are some patches uh, and you can almost see underneath the sort of ghostly uh, bleed through of like, okay, there you can see through to see where there was a building. Um, some physical, in some archives and libraries, they will actually like cut away the paste and like add a flap that you can like flip up to see what's underneath it. Um, but we, we have not done that. But you can see that there, oh, hopefully you can kind of see here um, that there's a lot of changes and that, that is part of that addition. Instead of making a new addition, we'll just paste some patches on. Um, also notable here, um, the St. Mary's School gets replaced and now it's this nice brick building here. And then 1954 is the last year that we have. So this is just what it looks like. Um, I don't know why they didn't fill in some of these. I think they just kind of left it and assumed it's a wood frame building. We're not going to waste all of our yellow ink, uh, but yeah. So another thing that we can do with these, these maps, let's take a, a, an example of a street like Curtis, uh, um, well, I'm uh, sorry, Clinton Street. So this is like a little, little block that is, it's kind of where Stewart Avenue Bridge goes. This is where the bridge would, would cross. Uh, so there's the Curtis and Yale plant to the, to the north, um, and then there's uh, a bunch of buildings to the south. And we don't, this is probably the best picture we have of this era. Um, there's not many pictures of this block, but it was a pretty important block for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of businesses that, <clears throat> businesses that were there um, and, and things like that. So in this example, if we wanted to know about that particular block, we don't have any pictures to go to to show us what it looked like. And so we can look at the Sandboard map. Um, and I don't really have too much to say. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through and you can see the development both of this block as well as just the neighborhood around it, um, which is kind of interesting. So this is 1884. This is 1891. This is 1898. Into the 20th century with 1904. Um, now, uh, yes, yeah, 1912. Now, one thing I am going to point out is this corner. Um, so uh, 1912, automobiles are starting to become a thing, um, and this turns out to be a pretty good location for a, a gas station, a service station. Um, and so they, they take down the buildings and then they add the service station. You can see the building underneath, which means that it was after 1923, but before 1931. And then in 1954, it becomes this concrete uh, building. So again, you can see the development of a neighborhood as well as if you wanted to look at a specific building. Um, and, and again, some of these buildings are labeled specifically. A lot of them are just, they just say drugstore, tavern, um, but still kind of useful, especially when used in conjunction with other resources, like for example, directories. All right, so finally, I wanna talk about uh, another way that we can use this. Um, so for this, I thought, hey, we have Colby maps too, city of Colby, let's do a Colby story. So um, I grabbed our postcard collection from Colby and I, I pulled out this building. I don't know where this building is. I'm not really versed in the, the development of Colby in the, in the grand scale, not particularly this building. Um, this postcard doesn't say where it is. It just says Christensen uh, Able uh, Company Store on Market Day. Uh, but this is a James Colby picture in Colby, which is, I, I know there's a similarity there. There's not really connection. They just happen to have the same last name. But this is a, a postcard taken in Colby. And this is a pretty distinct building. So I figured, hey, let's see if we can locate this building on a plat map. It's got six windows, it's got this nice brickwork on top, two storefronts. Well, um, what I decided to do is I decided to look and see, all right, um, is there other pictures that have this building in it, other postcards that we have? And sure enough, here we do. It's a different name and it's the Feinstall Brothers building. Um, but I'm pretty sure this is the same building. You see the same brickwork on top, six windows, two storefronts. And this one does tell us it's on Main Street, Main Street North. Um, Main Street is a street in, um, hold on, I was gonna do this. Uh, is a street in, in, in Colby, right? Um, so I figured, oh, great. That solves it right there. Um, and to prove it, let me just see if I can pull up. Here we go. So here's, here's Google Maps of Colby. And if we zoom in, uh, Main Street. Perfect, right? 
so it's, uh, it's looking north on Main Street, so we just got to figure out where it is in the block. So now let's just grab um, the Sanborn maps. Here's the east side of Colby, here's Main Street. But well, hold on, there's no brick buildings on Main Street and Colby. Um, well, there's this kind of wood frame residential building, but that doesn't match the same footprint. So, okay, well, let's maybe, maybe it's gone by 1914. This is five years after that picture was taken. You know, maybe, maybe there's something changed. Let's go back to 1900, right? So here's, here's what we're looking at. 1900, nope, still no buildings. Nope, maybe, maybe it's after. I don't know why that's possible, but you know, hey, let's just look. Nope, still no buildings in 1931. So that kind of means that this building can't actually be on Main Street. So where is it? Um, and again, if we look at this, we can kind of see, okay, there's a street that goes through in between two brick buildings. Um, there's some brick buildings here, but they don't quite match that footprint. So again, what I decided, all right, well, let's, let's go back to their postcard collection. Let's look at the images of Colby. I was looking specifically the first time for an image of this building, but maybe there's other landmarks that we can kind of, you know, triangulate where we are. So here's that one again, um, Main Street North. Here's one of East on Main Street. Here's one of looking South on Main Street or Main Street South. And then here's one the west side of Main Street. So Main Street's here. And um, yeah, and there is, you know, if you look at this building, so this is the building we're looking at, down the street, there is this kind of distinct building here, um, which is the Colby House. So you can see it on the, on the right, top right one here pretty clearly. Um, and it's down here too. And the Colby House, I saw that went, oh, you know what? I, was, I remember seeing that. It's on the west side. Um, I don't know if you can actually see this, but this building right here, it says Colby House. So then, okay, let's pull this up. If that's Colby House, you got a couple of wood structures, right? And then there's a brick structure and a street and then a book. Oh, so then here we are. That's, that's the building we're looking for. So a uh, gr great example here of how you can, like, had I not decided to try to find this on a Sandborn map, if I had just looked at Google Maps and went, oh, it's on Main Street, I probably just would have assumed sometime in the last century, the street changed. The building came down, somebody built something else, who knows? Uh, but by looking at the Sandborn map, we can get a very clear understanding of like, yeah, that's actually, um, it's on the wrong place. I think what actually happened here, so just, my expectation here is that, my guess, is that James Colby was a very busy photographer during this period. This is like his height of his, he would go get on the road, he'd go to hit a bunch of cities, take as many pictures as he could, and then he would come back to Wausau to his studio, drop off the images, get back on the road, take more. And in the meantime, his wife or his assistants would develop the pictures and make additions. And so they're the ones that write Main Street. And so maybe they just didn't get the notes. They didn't know that Main Street was other, already a place. And so they just kind of assumed, oh, this is Main Street. Um, there is one, because this is actually on Front Street and there's another postcard here where it says Front Street. So um, they corrected it at some point. So yeah, I think that's a nice, uh, maybe stop, stopping point for um, the Sanborn map. Um, as I said, really cool uh, kind of map. It, it, again, not intended for this purpose, but really useful for a lot of different purposes. Um, if you're interested, by the way, in, in, in exploring uh, the city of Wausau, Colby, any other city in Wisconsin, or actually pretty much anywhere in the United States, um, if there's a city that existed back in the 1800s, early 1900s, there's probably a Sandmore map of it. Um, the, <clears throat> I think the Library of Congress, I believe. So let me just double check here. Is it the Library of Congress? I believe so. Library of Congress, yes. Uh, they've actually digitized um, a lot of this, which is actually where most of our, uh, these images came from. Um, so if you're interested, I'll, I'll put the links in, in the, the description, the chat, um, and you can kind of explore it in your own right. Um, you know, maybe look up your neighborhood or, or see if it's, it's represented or just kind of, you know, get in. You, can, you don't have to stay in, in the area. You can go wherever, um, which is kind of cool. So yeah, thanks, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed.